I would like to help us to make a preparation for the preparation. Prepare for Advent. In other words, get our mind and our heart uh, oriented towards that period of preparation. Now, we know that in the liturgical calendar, Advent, uh, in the order of time, uh, immediately precedes Christmas. So we have Advent, then Christmas, the Christmas season. That is a kind of a figurative representation, however, of what's really important. And what's really important is the preparation we make for the coming of the Lord definitively. And I don't mean the end of the world so much. Uh, you know, very often, especially now, or I would say leading up to, uh, you know, the new millennium, we had all kinds of talk about the end, right? People were concerned about um, Y2K. I almost forgot the term. You know, it was, it, right, these terms pop up and then they fade in, into obscurity very quickly. But we were worried about that. Oh, something's going to happen and, you know, New Year's Eve, maybe the whole world will blow up or something. There were even movies about it. Well, it came and went. And it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. You know what matters? Your end and mine. That's what matters. When we have to meet our maker, so to speak, that matters, right? And so, preparation for that. That's what Advent really does for us. It, it reminds us that, yes, we're preparing for the coming of the Lord at Christmas, but that should really wake us up to the fact that we need to be preparing for his coming at the end of our life, when we die and stand before him, and give an account of everything we did and failed to do. That's the real preparation. That's what matters. And you know, in the final analysis, it's the only thing that matters. Let me tell you one of the worst pitfalls of our culture. It preoccupies us. We're so preoccupied with making money, making a living, making ends meet, that we forget about the only thing that really matters. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't support your family. Of course, we've, we've got to have a home to live in. We've got to have clothing and food and so forth. You've got to do that. You should be, you should be very um, assiduous in, in uh, supporting your family and so forth. You've got to take care of everyday business. Absolutely. But don't lose sight of the big picture. And the big picture is this. Our life is a preparation for the coming of the Lord. Please never forget it. The life of the Christian is an advent which prepares for the coming of the Lord. Let me repeat that. The life of the Christian is an advent which prepares for the coming of the Lord. When I was ordained a priest on Trinity Sunday, 1991, uh, a priest uh, usually have a, an ordination card, you know, that has your ordination. It's a holy card. You know, I had a picture of the Blessed Mother. And uh, on the back, uh, you know, has your, the priest's name, ordained such and such a date at St. Peter's Basilica, Vatican City, and so on. I had a, um, and usually there's a little saying that the... the uh, man who's ordained, puts a little saying on that ordination card that means something to him, a spiritual saying, maybe some words from the gospel or from a saint. And I had some very beautiful words from blessed um, Elizabeth of the Trinity at the time. She, she was a great Carmelite saint. And the words were, and she was talking about the Carmelite nun, but I, I, I took it kind of in the reverse. She said the, the life of the Carmel Carmelite nun is like the life of a priest, which is an advent which prepares for the coming of the Lord. I just kind of paraphrase that. But th this is a very profound spiritual assertion. It means something. 
and, and it can be extended. Yes, the life of the priest, or the life of a nun, or the life of any one of you, is an advent which prepares for the coming of the Lord. Now you can use all kinds of symbolism and all kinds of examples to try to illustrate this and get the point across. Be ready. Right? Uh, President Bush said to the military, get ready. Hmm? I'm saying to you, get ready. And it's a perfect time to say it, it's Advent. Get ready. The Lord is coming sooner than you think. When I buried my father on September 11th, it was, that was obviously, in, for many reasons, an unusual day. We'll all of us will never forget it. I mean, I, I'll never forget it because it was my dad's funeral, but also because it was September 11th, and, you know, we know what happened September 11th. So many things converged on that day. Uh, for me, personally, an old era died. A previous time was laid to rest. And we, we, we heard it a million times, right? It'll never be the same after this, right? Life will be different from now on. We heard that a million one time, didn't we? A different, uh, the president said it, many, many said, it's different now. You and I grew up in a relatively safe period in the United States. Now, yes, there were wars. I mean, I already told you, my grandfather, World War I, my dad, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. We always have a war going on, it seems. But for us, citizens of the United States of America, my lifetime, the last 54 years, has been a relatively protected, safe place. Living here in the United States, we never had an attack on our soil, did we? I mean, even in, the, the world, even in World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Nobody fired a rocket at us. Nobody fired a shot at us through all those wars. We were safe on our own soil. And then it all ended. The morning of September 11th. And so when I laid my father to rest that morning of September 11th, uh, I couldn't help but experience a sense of laying a lot of things to rest. A lot of the old ways laid to rest. Sadly, it was a great thing, uh, feeling you were safe. We never thought about it, did we? Why, you never had to think about whether you're safe or not in the United States. I think it was, what, the War of 1812? the last time we had ever experienced an attack on our soil, we had been immune from that. Do you know why? It's important to know why, uh, whatever you're talking about. It's good to know why a certain thing is. I'll tell you why, because God protected us. That's why. I've been saying that for years, long before September 11th was ever a thought in a terrorist's head. I've been saying to my beloved country, we're safe because God makes us safe. And the moment God removes his hand to wake us up, we won't be safe. We'll get our butt kicked up one side, down the other. Sure enough. It happened, and it can happen again. Much worse. We got off cheap. Bad as it was. Bad as it was. What if those planes had biological or chemical weapons on board? What if they had a nuclear device? Then the thousands go into hundred thousands and millions of casualties. And you know what? It's just not that much harder to up the ante. Oh, it really isn't. Not much harder at all. And the only thing that separates 
the lesser from the greater casualties is the hand of God. And don't forget that, please. Do not be carried away by any political rhetoric, any blustering or posturing. We are safe to the degree and only to the degree that God makes us safe. Everything now is very different. If before we could get away with sitting on a moral fence, I assure you now we cannot. One of the uh, criticisms that I get now and then, and uh, let me tell you something, anyone who has any significant effect on people is going to get it from both sides. You know that, right? Uh, I, I'm good enough at what I do, and I know it, and that's not pride. That's the acknowledgement of truth, actually. I'm good enough at what I do to be hated. Do you understand that? I'm good enough at what I do to be hated and loved by rather large numbers of people. All the prophets were that way. They were hated. How much were the prophets hated? Most of them got killed. That's how much they were hated. Jesus, the consummation of all the prophets and all prophecy, he was hated. Do you understand that Jesus Christ was hated in his own day and still is by many, although they wouldn't say, I hate Jesus Christ. They hate his teaching. They hate his church. They hate what that represents. Then again, countless millions love him. And they love his teaching. And of course, you are among the number of those who love the Lord and his teaching. There are a lot of weak-minded, weak-spirited people who don't like to talk in those clear terms. Okay, that's fine. They're entitled to that, but I don't have time to mince words. I am painfully aware that the clock is ticking. The older I get, the less time I have for games, for watering things down. The end is near. And when I say that, I, once again now, don't mean the end of the world. I know nothing of that. I mean the end is near for me, okay? I won't even say it for you, although I can think it. <laughs> and you know, you know. But for me, I am aware that my end is fast approaching. I know it. Well, thank God. Someone asked my grandmother when she hit her 90th birthday, <laughs> she said, they said, they said to her, oh, Angeline, well, you've had a wonderful life. Uh, I wish you 90 more. And she said in horror, what did I ever do to you? <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me of the same thing happened to Padre Pio on the 50th anniversary of his stigmata. You know, he had the wounds of our Lord, and <laughs> that was a painful uh, gift God gave him. And a person came up to him, at, they had a party for him at the monastery. And a person came up and said, ah, Padre Pio, Padre Pio, may you have 50 more. And he said, ah, what have I ever done to you? <laughs> well, it's not that bad. You live your life. You do the best you can. You serve your family. You serve society, most of all. You serve God in serving all those other things. And then you go in peace. And then you're happy forever. Now that's not so bad. That's very good. You know, when I think about, oh, I, I've thought about the last few years, you know, I've had a couple health scares. No big deal. Nothing, nothing major. Um, I had some death threats even. And, uh, you know, the only thing that <laughs> some guy from a newspaper interviewed me once, and he said, well, when, when you were threatened, um, what did you... And I don't know where, but, you know, my dirty Harry mentality. He said, what did you think? I said, make my day. <laughs> Big stinking deal. 
you know, so I'm out of here. You know, that, that, that's so, like, I mean, not that I'm, I want presumptuous. I, I don't presume. You know, I definitely don't merit heaven. I know that. But my fear of hell is greatly exceeded by my trust in God. Hmm? That's really the way we have to think and act. I mean, I, I know that I don't deserve a whole heck of a lot after my, I've done a lot of bad things in my life. But I trust in the mercy of the Lord. I really do. I don't rely on my own merit. Do you know what the theological virtue of hope is? Now, Advent is a time of hope. It really is. But just like Lent, you know, I mean, Lent's a time of penance, true. Advent's a time of penance. See, I have a purple stole on. I, I'm uh, anticipating the coming of Advent this evening. With evening prayer one, we begin Advent. Vigil Mass. It'll be the Mass of Advent. Got the purple stole on. Advent's a time of hope. Why? Because the Lord is coming. Yes, he's coming at Christmas. One beautiful Christmas. The great feast of Christmas. But the Lord is coming for me personally. He's coming for you personally. He's not coming to judge you with vengeance. He's coming to embrace you and greet you. Let me tell you something. If you desire heaven, I'll guarantee you God desires heaven for you much more than you and I desire it for ourselves. For he is God, and everything about him is infinite. Our desires and our sins are finite. God's desire, God's will is infinite. And that God wants you in heaven with him forever. Now there's a thought that should inspire hope. Do you know what hope is? Hope is the theological virtue by which we desire, note that word desire, by which we desire heaven and eternal life, trusting not in our own strength, but rather in the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Now that is the theological virtue of hope right out of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, Father Mike didn't tell you, but this afternoon, before I conclude, the doors will all be locked. And there will be an examination. You will have to pass an examination on the basics of your faith, or you will never get out of line. Some of the children are looking with big eyes. What, a test? You didn't tell me there was going to be a test. Mom, you brought me over here to the church. You didn't tell me I have to pass a test. <laughs> now I've got you. And one of the questions on the test will be, define the theological virtue of hope. Obviously, all of you would get it. Even before I just gave the definition, not more than two of you would have missed it, probably, two or three. Of course, for the sake of the two or three, I articulated the definition. I will now repeat it. And since your life depends on it, listen carefully. <laughs> and don't ever forget it. Hope is the theological virtue by which we desire heaven and eternal life, relying not on our own strength, but on the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Now, you know... A lot of people nowadays are intimidated by memorization. Um, we, ha we had, even in education for a while, and especially in religious education, we had what I could term a period or phase of temporary insanity. Hmm? And uh, part of what marked that was a, an abhorrence or an intimidation with memorizing things. And we somehow thought that that's bad. Oh, well, Rotner, that's no good. You need to interiorize it with your heart. That's true. That's true. But the two aren't mutually exclusive. You have to memorize certain things. You don't believe it? I'll tell you what, then. If you don't believe that, then I want you to drive across a bridge 
constructed by an engineer who never remembered the principles of mathematics. You say, oh, it's not important to memorize things. Good, then I would like you to have brain surgery performed by a surgeon who couldn't remember the principles of anatomy. Hmm? You say, not on your life, buddy. I'm not doing that. I would never do that. I, I want the engineer to be competent. I want the surgeon to be competent. I want the accountant to be competent. I want the bricklayer to be competent. I want the carpenter and the plumber to be competent. I do too. And how about the Christian? Shouldn't we be competent in our faith? Sure we should. What's hope? Advent is a season of hope. Advent is a preparation for the coming of the Lord. Is the coming of the Lord a bad thing? No, the coming of the Lord is a great thing. There is no greater thing. We're preparing for peace. We're preparing for joy. Won't heaven be great? Man, people who are afraid to leave this life, I understand that. Listen, I'm afraid of a lot of things. You know, don't let the gruff preacher exterior fool you. I am a chicken. <laughs> With respect to a lot of things. I, sp I, I spend sleepless nights fearful. The older I get, it seems, the more fearful I become. That's wrong. That's stupid. It is not. God. Uh, the lady who works in my office, God gave her to me to remind me of a lot of things. She has, a per she has the same gift that I have in a, as a layperson. You know, a lot of people think my gift is preaching. I, I often remind people, well, thanks be to God for whatever measure of that gift I have. But my real gift is that I don't give a fat rat's patoot who likes what I say. <laughs> That's my real gift, you see. And the lady that works in my office also has that gift. <laughs> but it, it, with respect to me. God has given her to me to keep me straight. He said, you're the priest. What are you worried about? And you know, then she'll give it to me right between the eyes. Hey, or my mother, you know. I get worried and I, you know, well, hey, no matter how old sons become, even if they get ordained priest, mom is always mom. And you know, I'll be visiting with my mother and maybe worried about something and expressing my anxiety and just say, hey. And, and if there's a Bible handy, and there always is, she'll say, pick it up and say, do we, lo do we know the last chapter of the book or not? Priest, son, we won. I mean, now, am, am I, did I miss something? We win, right? In the end, we win. That's the last chapter of the book. Jesus wins. He achieves the victory, the definitive, eternal victory through his passion, death, and resurrection. We are inheritors of the promise. We're winners. Okay? If you've got to play a football game, or a baseball game, or a basketball game, and in advance, you know the outcome of the game. Let's say you know you're going to win... 49 to 7. You'd have a lot more confidence playing the game, wouldn't you? I mean, you would, you would clobber the, the opposition. We know the end. We win. In Jesus, we have the victory. What we have to do is accept it. We have to accept the victory, and that's what life is about. This advent, this preparation, which is our human life, is a question of accepting the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we do that? We do it by believing. We do it by having faith, first of all. Now, being one of those easy teachers, you know, you ever have those teachers who told you in advance what the questions on the quiz would be? 
Remember those teachers? They, maybe they even gave them to They said, all right, um, the test tomorrow will be on these questions. You can't ask for much more than that. I'm, I'm giving you the questions. So when we lock the doors at 3 o'clock, <clears throat> one of the questions will be, what is the theological virtue of faith? Now, I always, already told you what hope is. What's the theological virtue of faith? And once again, being tremendously knowledgeable Catholics, all but two or three will get it. And when we ask that question, you will rattle it right off with absolute perfection. You won't even miss a beat. Faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God, believe all that God has said and revealed to us, and believe all that Holy Church proposes for our belief, because he who has revealed it is truth itself. Now, young man, would you repeat that? <laughs> He's hiding under the pew. <laughs> That's right, faith. The theological virtue by which we believe in God. Now, you could stop right there and basically have it right. You know, some people, I say, what's faith? They say, well, I believe in God. Right, if we understood what it really means when we say, I believe, we believe, we'd have it, but we don't. So the rest of the definition is necessary to expound upon that first part of the definition. Faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God. Now, if you believe in God, in fact, you believe all that God has said and revealed to us. How are you going to believe it if you don't know what it is? Hence, the need to learn your faith. I am astounded at the level of ignorance of the faith of the, of the average Catholic. When I began preaching 10 years ago, I had the habit, wherever I would go, because I had just come out of 10 years of academic preparation, you know, I was results-oriented. And you have to be. You've got to be results-oriented in any sphere of endeavor, whether that's business, the military, sports, academics, parenting. You want to be results-oriented. That doesn't mean necessarily success. Mother Teresa used to say, God doesn't need your success, only your fidelity. And if you're faithful, you're successful. Okay? Faith. The theological virtue by which we believe in God. If you believe in God, you believe all that God has said and revealed to you. <clears throat> if you love God with your whole heart, mind, and strength, you, can, you want to know God, don't you? I mean, can you imagine saying you love someone with all your mind, heart, and strength, but you could care less about learning anything about that person? That, that's nonsense. Uh, husbands and wives, when you first met and when you were attracted to each other, didn't you want to spend time together? Didn't you want to get to know each other? Of course. Well, we're supposed to love God with our whole heart, mind, and strength. If we do, we want to know about him. To know the faith is to know God. So you learn your faith and then you interiorize it. You make it part of yourself. Memorization of these definitions of that, you know, that, that's not enough, obviously. But it's important. It's important. Faith, hope, and charity. Those are ways to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Those are the theological virtues infused in our soul at baptism, right? When we were baptized, most of us when we were infants, what happened at baptism is mysteriously, mystically, sacramentally, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity were infused into our soul. Those theological virtues capacitated us to live the life of Christ. Sanctifying grace was infused. Sanctifying grace is a share in divine life. Uh, it, now, if one of the questions on the exam is, what is sanctifying grace? You will say, well, quite simply, Father, sanctifying grace is a share in divine life. And you'll be right. Sanctifying grace, which comes to us primarily through the sacraments, is a share in divine life. That capacitates us. 
Let me give you an analogy. Analogies are good. Electricity. I don't know anything much about electricity, but I do know that to have power, now we have power here, we have lights on. In order for those lights to shine, they have to be plugged into the power source, don't they? If they weren't plugged into the electricity, into the power, no light. Okay. If you're not plugged into God, you can't shine. That's sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is the power which allows us to live a godly life. Very often, in talking about preparation or in preparing people, they will say to me, exasperated, disillusioned, discouraged, I just can't do it. They may be enslaved to a certain sin. Everybody has what I call a favorite sin. It's the one you confess over and over again. You know the one. Most of us have those favorite sins. Now, some of us, if we could do away with our mouth, we would do away with sin. A lot of us sin with our mouth, right? And some wise guy in the back is thinking, yeah, why don't you shut up? <laughs> well, no, that's my job. But you know what I mean, like uh, gossip, slander. Some people do that. A lot of people do that. Very often, for good Catholics, that's the last thing to go. I mean, very often, you get older, you get wiser. You begin to think with your brain rather than hormones. And things start to go better. And you don't have to confess a lot of the sins you confessed when you were 20 or 25, right? Because you're, you're making progress, and that's good. Often, though, the last thing to go are those sins of the tongue. St. James said the tongue is a mighty weapon, huh, for better or for worse. I'm going to give a talk later on how to make good confession. And during that talk, I'll talk about the Ten Commandments. And the Eighth Commandment, concerns truth. The sins against truth. Well, lying, yeah. But, but sins like slander. Libel. Detraction. That's a big one. Most people never heard of it. Now, if I put that on the exam this afternoon and said, describe the sin of detraction, most of you wouldn't get it, I bet. Do you know that you're not allowed to recount the faults of another, even if they're true. You know that's a sin, a sin of detraction, very common sin. Oh Lord, acquit me from hidden faults. Prepare. Faith, hope, and charity. Three tests, three, three questions on the test. Faith, theological virtue by which we believe in God, believe all God has said and revealed to us, believe all that Holy Church, for Christ and his church are one, we believe all Holy Church proposes for our belief. That means I accept the teaching of the Catholic Church. Period, exclamation point. I'm not a wise guy. I'm not a dissident. I don't dissent. I give assent to what is revealed. That's what faith is. I assent to the teaching of the church. I don't say abortion is okay under certain circumstances. That's not what the church teaches. I don't say artificial contraception is okay. That's not what the church teaches. And if I don't believe that, I don't have faith. Because I don't believe everything Holy Church proposes for my belief. Now, some of you might not like that. Tough. You don't have a problem with me. You've got a problem with Jesus Christ and his church, who are one in their teaching. Why do I believe all that? Because it sounds good? Nope. Because it's plausible? No. Because it's logical. Why do I believe all that God has said and revealed? Why do I believe all that Holy Church proposes for my belief? Why? Because he who has revealed it is truth itself. That's why I believe it. 
not because the Pope says so or this, that, the other. I believe it because the Pope says so, because I know he has a special gift to teach truth. But the real reason is behind the Pope is Christ, the real rock upon which our faith and the church is built. Jesus. He teaches through his church. That's why I believe. That's faith. Hope. The theological virtue by which we desire heaven and eternal life is our true happiness. Trusting not in our own strength. I tried that all my life and it didn't work. I am prone to fall on my face. And just when I think I'm a tough guy and strong enough to take on the whole universe, God in his goodness humbles me. Slaps me upside the head and says, wake up, silly boy. You can't do anything without me. Hope. The theological virtue by which I desire heaven and eternal life as my true happiness. Let me tell you something. There are all kinds of little happinesses along the way, and they're not bad. And I wish you many of them. I wish you success in every sphere of endeavor. I hope you have a happy home and a wonderful family. I hope you have a great job and you get promotion after promotion. I, I hope you have all kinds of good things. Those things in the end will not make you happy because they will not get you to heaven. The only thing in the end that will make you happy is heaven and eternal life. That's our hope. To get there, I can't rely on my own strength. I have to rely on the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, eternal life. The Holy Spirit, the gift who contains all gifts. That's hope. Charity. Charity is the theological virtue by which we love God above all things for his own sake and love our neighbor as ourselves out of love for God. Faith, hope, and charity. Preparation. It's an advent. Preparing for the coming of the Lord. You know, in order to love our neighbor as ourselves, we have to first have that vertical dimension of love of God established. You've got to first have a relationship with God. Otherwise, you're not going to have the power, the strength, the endurance to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you think so, mistakenly, God will show you that you're wrong. How? Well, usually we don't even get past the first stage. Can you love the person you live with day in and day out? Well, you say, yes, I can't. Even that's a test, isn't it? In the old days, saints did a lot of penance. They used to, some of them used to wear a thing called a hair shirt. You know what a hair shirt is? Some of the day it was a very uncomfortable thing, made out of horse hair, very coarse, itchy. Made you uncomfortable. We don't wear a hair shirt anymore. You know, you, you know why? Your hair shirt might be sitting next to you. Hmm? You might be living with your hair shirt. You might be married to your hair shirt. That's right. Hey, the ones we're closest to very often rub us the wrong way. That's why marriage is a sanctifying thing. Oh, you better believe it. Husbands will rub the rough edges right off their wives. Wives, you'll do the same to your husband. I have a relative, a wonderful, a good man, and he's married to a woman who's a good woman. They're wonderful people. But for years, my whole life, I watched this particular female relative of mine torture this man. <laughs> now, she's not a bad person. But our God, help us. This poor man, she, I mean, torture. Getting about close to 50 years now. Rough, rough, rough on him. Sweet as can be to everybody else. 
that man will be canonized. <laughs> and the only reason is, is because of that woman. Now many of you are thinking, perhaps I too will be canonized. <laughs> or oh, it might be your husband, might be your wife, might be your parents, might be your children, might be your pastor, might be your flock. We all play a part in rubbing the rough edges off of each other. Like gemstones, you know? You know how you polish emeralds or diamonds? They put them in a tumbler with grit. Now every one of us has been grit at one time or another. We all polish each other. We all rub the rough edges off of each other. If we can live in charity, if we can recognize that we're not all the same, if we can recognize that one person's strengths might be another person's weaknesses, we're not all the same, and we're not supposed to be. But if we can accept each other patiently, charitably, we grow. Now that's preparation. Faith, hope, charity. We prepare through prayer. People will often say to me, I started to say it a minute ago, I, I, I just, I'm discouraged, I can't overcome my sin, my favorite sin, whatever it is. Hey, it might be kleptomania, they may steal things. I, I know the wonderful people, elderly even sometimes, they cannot resist, they go into Walmart or someplace and they steal things. I mean, they're not big-time criminals, but boy, they get busted, you know, they could be in trouble, but they do it, and they can't seem to break themselves of it. Now, other people have some sexual sin that they're addicted to. Many people today are addicted to pornography. It's a horrible scourge. I mean millions. It's terrible. Terrible addiction. Drugs, alcohol, these things steal our human freedom. They impoverish us and diminish us. They cause great misery. And they say, I, I, I just can't break, break free. And I sympathize with that. I sympathize very much with it. And I say, look, what you need is power. Very often we think what we need is knowledge. Now, knowledge is good, but what we need is power. I would dare say that most of us know enough to be canonized saints. Unfortunately, no saint was ever canonized for what he knew. Saints are canonized for what they do, not for what they know. And in order to do, that's a function of the will, you need strength, you need power, you need grace. That comes from prayer. You need to pray. Bottom line, pray the rosary every day. Now you, uh, you know, the common retort of a lot of people, well, you can't tell me how to pray. You're right, I can't, but I will anyway. Pray the rosary. Oh, I like to pray other ways. My experience is that most of those people who say they like to pray other ways don't, except once in a great while. But if you pray the rosary every day, there it is, 15, 20 minutes, you do it. It's a good formula, powerful prayers. One of my talks today is going to be on the rosary, and it's power. You just do it, and you will not be sorry. There is great power in that rosary. What will happen? Why, mysteriously, almost unknown to you, you'll have the strength to do what's right. You'll have the power to get through the day. I'm not saying you'll be without your struggles and without your share of the cross. Oh, yeah. You'll have your share of the cross, but you'll have the strength to carry it. The sacraments. How do you get ready? You get ready, prepare for the coming of the Lord, Advent, through the sacraments, the sacramental life of the church. Confession. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to talk on making a good confession later today. Look, a lot of you, thank God, don't live in mortal sin. You know, you, you're, you're decent people. But, but even if you're not, even if you are living in mortal sin, look, i got good news for you. Relief is just an instant away. You go make good confession, and your sin... Confession is one of the greatest gifts. A lot of people don't like confession. You know that? They just don't like confession. <clears throat> That's like saying, if there was one thing, let's say I had terminal cancer, God forbid, and there was a wonder drug, 
If I take that, one dose, the cancer is killed, gone, history. And I say, I hate that wonder drug. I wouldn't, I, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm scared of it. I'm not going to do that. I find that that wonder drug is demeaning. You're nuts. <laughs> In plain English. Take the doggone wonder drug and get healed. Now that's confession. Cancer is mortal sin. Get rid of it. You go to confession. That's part of preparation. Receive Jesus in the Eucharist. You know, all the sacraments, all seven of them, they all prepare us, cleanse us, dignify us, ennoble us, strengthen us for the coming of the Lord. Sacramental life of the church, the great thing. The cross. There is no authentic holiness of life without the cross. Now, I can tell you, as I have said many, many times over the years, I can summarize it for you, synthesize it. No pain, no gain. You got that? No pain, no gain. Period, exclamation point, that's it. And I don't mean to trivialize your suffering your unique cross. I know it's difficult. And I do sympathize with it. Whether it's physical pain or suffering, whether it's emotional struggle, moral struggle, that's a share in the cross. We've got to carry our cross. You say, I don't want to. So I say, you know what? I don't blame you. I don't want to either. You know, you want to go on strike? Call strike against God? Ha <laughs> ha. Good luck. <laughs> Our arms are too short to box with God. You're not going to win that fight. And if God ordains a specific cross for you, it's good. You may say, no, it can't be good. Cancer can't be good. I agree with you. I hate it. You may say, September 11th couldn't be good. I agree with you. Broke my heart, too. You know what, though? Must be good. Why? God allowed it. What? You say, how can that be? Listen, I'm going to give you a principle. God permits evil only to bring a greater good out of it. Now, are you going to say God didn't permit it? You're defeated. You're defeated by logic right there. What do you mean? God did, it happened, didn't it? Nothing can happen without God permitting it. God's all-powerful. God's all-knowing. God's all-seeing. God can cause or permit anything, and does. Anything that happens, believe me, God allowed it to happen. Does he directly will moral evil? No. But he will permit... How, how, what's the proof? Right there. I love it when I'm in a church with a big crucifix. Right there. You look at that. That is the absolute definitive proof that God permits evil. You don't think deicide is evil? You don't think creatures crucifying their creator is evil? You don't think Jesus being spat upon and tortured is evil? That's evil. There isn't anything more evil than that. And yet... It is the greatest good imaginable, the good of redemption. And so there's the proof that God permits evil in order to ultimately draw greater good out of it. And you can extend that principle to anything in life. The cross is preparation. My dad, I told you about my dad. I appreciate very much that the parish offered the mass last night for the repose of my father's soul. Um, I told you my, my dad died right before September 11th. I buried him September 11th. The last years of his life were intensely an advent, a preparation for the coming of the Lord. We don't know the day or the hour, but God knows it. God knew the moment my father would pass from time into eternity, and he prepared him. 
Well, my dad had lived a rough life. He wasn't a paragon of spirituality or morality. He was a rough, fighting, gambling, drinking kind of guy. Made a lot of mistakes in his life. The last years of his life, he lived in a state of grace. He prayed as best he could in his simple way. And he accepted the cross, and it purified him. And it strengthened him. And it sanctified him. His life became an advent which prepared for the coming of the Lord. And so it is for you and for me. Remember, Advent is a preparation for the coming of the Lord. And I tell you with 100% certainty, the Lord is coming. He is coming soon at Christmas, but more importantly, he is coming to greet each one of us personally at the end of our life. Prepare. Be vigilant. Don't be afraid. Be confident, for God is a good, loving, and merciful God. God bless you.